day, they see two dimensions to all the chaos and injustice. Human rebels who are being corrupted by the worship of spiritual rebels, the idol gods of money, sex, and military power. Yeah, when humans give their allegiance to these powers, it leads to a world like ours. Right, and the best example of this is the story of the Exodus, where we're told that the Egyptian genocide of the Israelites was inspired by Pharaoh and by the gods of Egypt. That's really intense. But it's not the end of the story. When God rescued the Israelites from Egypt and its gods, he invited them to become his covenant partners and learn a different way of ruling the world. And they agree to it, but in the end they don't honor the partnership. They give their allegiance to other gods. And so this leads to their exile in Babylon, where they become slaves once again to a foreign nation and their spiritual rulers, awaiting a new exodus into freedom. And this is where the story of Jesus picks up. He said he was here to rescue the world and take it back from the rebels. Which rebels, the human ones or the spiritual ones? Exactly. For Jesus, it was all connected. When he marched into Jerusalem for Passover, he was announcing the ultimate exodus. He was there to confront and overcome all rebel powers and authorities, and he did it by giving up his life. So this is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities triumphing over them by the cross. Yes, Jesus condemned our evil by allowing the rebels to unleash all their hate and evil on him. But then he overcame it with the power of his love and resurrection life. And then Jesus told his followers that all authority in heaven and earth now belongs to him. Now the ultimate human and divine partner. This is really good news. Yeah, and it's why the apostles started inviting everyone to give their allegiance to the risen Jesus to discover freedom and a new way to be human. Now, while Jesus gained a decisive victory over the rebel powers, he didn't destroy them. They're still around causing problems. Yes, and in fact, they are the problem. The apostles said that humanity's real enemy is never another human. Rather, it's the spiritual powers that animate our cultural idols that inspire hatred, division, and violence. Ah, so when I see people hurting other people, behind it is the divine counsel gone rogue. How do you deal with this kind of enemy? Well, the Apostle Paul said we can resist by putting on the character traits of Jesus like armor, faithfulness, justice, and peace. And he said that our only weapon is the word of God. That is, the biblical story of good news that Jesus has overcome all rebels with the divine power of his life and love. You just watched a video on the Divine Council. Now there are more spiritual beings in the heavenly realm along with the Divine Council. They're called angels and cherubim, and that's what we're going to look at next. Take 15. I'm thinking about doing all mine in different accents. <laughs> Which U.S. state is known for its extra small soft drinks? Texas. Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call monkeys? with a shared Amazon account. I don't know. Prime mates. <laughs> That's good. Uh, do you know how many meals Vin Diesel eats in a day? No. Just uh, just two. Breakfast and breakfast. God. <laughs> breakfast. Breakfast and breakfast. <laughs> What's Whitney Houston's favorite type of coordination? I don't know. And I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish you would have finished
finish that, that would have been great. My wife asked me to fix some wiring in our kitchen that was messed up. And she was shocked when she found out I wasn't an electrician. <laughs> Where do you find a cow with no legs? I don't know. Wherever you left it. <laughs> wow, wow. So good to see everybody. Hey, happy Father's Day to all the dads in the house. I'm watching you guys to stand up with us. Whatever you're watching, let me tell you, Today's going to be a great day. We're going to worship Jesus. So as you walk in, just be ready. The lyrics are going to be up there. We're going to sing with everything in us because it's worthy of our worship. So let's sing this together. Here we go. Stand against the power 
This week we've been on the road well, for the last couple of weeks and she wasn't feeling too good and, and I could hear from her room. She was singing herself to sleep through the night with a fever. Hey, dads, are you getting this right here? I was like, baby, is that our baby girl singing through the night, literally? And she was singing the song that she's learning a kiss break. This is what I want to put before you, this power in the things that we sing. It changes everything. It changes everything. It really does. It really does. So if my three-year-old can do that, I think you and I can do that. Amen. Can we sing that one more time? So when I fight. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet I sing through the night Oh God, the battle belongs to you Amen Come on, we sing this believing does fight for us and he has every victory. Every victory is yours Every 
Church, let's keep singing. Let's keep worshiping because he is worthy of our praise. I invite you to sing this with us. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. Let's sing this together. Come on. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, let's sing this. Across the world is finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now, from the lips of the forgiven, that's you and me. Here and let the arise. Cause Jesus your life. Oh, you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Celebrate. Let's sing this together. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. I need somebody to sing this with me. You sent the darkness running. Come on. Out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running. Come on. Out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory. Enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running. Out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory. Enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness. Yes, Father, we believe that. And so we submit our wills to yours today, collectively honoring you for who you are, your faithfulness to your people. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate that fact. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen, everyone. Welcome and happy Father's Day. Listen, I was over here worshiping. Yeah, we can clap for the dads in the room. That'd be great. I was over here, I usually sit over here and, and sometimes I look back over uh, the congregation and I had this line of people and I saw Jason Wilson, who I get to do this dad thing with. We both have three boys, they're almost exactly the same ages. And then I saw Shane Duffy, who I literally scheduled an appointment with one time and said, tell me how to get my boys to turn out like your boys. Then I saw Kurt Gibbons, who's a little bit ahead of me in this thing. Kurt, I hope it's okay that I said your name. We love you, thank you. Uh, and he teaches me how to do it. And John Shelton, I work with some of his children and I'm just so grateful for the dads in the room. So I wanna take the first minute of this time and let you encourage a dad near you. So if there's a father near you, I want you to take a minute, tell them something you're grateful for about them, okay? You can go now, tell somebody that you know is a dad near you something you're grateful for. Riley, I'm grateful for the way you put stuff down and love your kids when they run up to you. Love you guys, you can take a seat. Happy Father's Day if you're a dad in the room. Enjoy the day if you're a kid in the room. Give your dad an extra tight hug. If you're not a hugging family, try it out. It's nice. I didn't grow up in a big hugging family and my family is a big hugging family and I like it. I may not hug you, but my boys, I'm gonna hug them. I love them a whole lot. My name is Alan, I'm one of the pastors here. If I haven't met you, I'd love to do that after this service out in the atrium. We're glad you're here. There's a lot going on in New Spring right now. We've got Juneteenth coming back tonight for that. We're very excited about what's gonna happen there. We have the summer celebration next week where we're gonna have fireworks. I like that. Thank you, Brady, appreciate it. So there's a lot going on. And I was, as I was thinking about this time and how to knit all of these things together, just my cards on the table, I got a little stressed. I was like, God, there are a lot of things happening. Like, how am I gonna do all this stuff? And I, I began to get tense. And then I thought about the way that I approach giving sometimes and my mind took me, I think the Lord took me to this place where I realized I, I like to control stuff and specifically I like to control things with my money. And God said to me, the reason that's so hard for you is that dependence on me equals freedom and you don't like to equate dependence with freedom. And I didn't like that, but I'm pretty sure I didn't think it. I'm pretty sure that the Lord thought it. And so if you're here today and, and giving is a challenge for you. I, I wanna tell you on the other side of that obedience is freedom because God designed it that way because he didn't want us to carry this thing alone. So if you came prepared to give today, you can do that in the give boxes, you can give online or you can give through the app. And if you do give, thank you, it allows us to engage things like Juneteenth, to engage things like the summer celebration, to come together and have our kids receive Jesus on their level. I was so encouraged by the story that Charlie shared about his daughter and, and what she's learned in Kids Spring. I've seen it in my own life for 14 years since Eddie was born. And speaking of my children, I get the great privilege today of having the word read by my middle son, Charlie. So Charlie, if you wanna come on out. How about that, Charlie? Charlie met the Lord several years ago. I had the privilege of baptizing him right here. Buddy, I'm super proud of you. I'm thankful to be up here with you. So I'm going to, in the, in the tradition that I grew up in, I'm going to ask you guys to stand up for the reading of God's Word. And Charlie, I'm going to hand it off to you. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the he evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, 
that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as it ought to speak. Great job, buddy. Hey, I'm proud of you. That was such an encouragement to me. I love you. And we want you guys to be encouraged on this Father's Day, too. So we put something together. You guys can take a seat and check this out. one of those things that you always uh, wonder how you're going to do. As a kid, like, man, man, I'm going to be a dad one day, you know, something like that. But uh, in Psalm, actually, Psalm 37, 23, uh, that says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Man, it, it is, it is that's, what, that's what makes being a father so challenging because it's not what I want to do. I don't want to set my pride aside. I don't want to, I want to be angry sometimes. I want to throw things sometimes, but I've got to check myself and be like, okay, is it worth doing this? For my kids, who I'm trying to teach about Jesus, if they see me do this, what are they going to think about the Father in heaven? Are they going to have a better understanding of Him? Is He going to be patient like Daddy's patient? Is He going to do this like Daddy's doing it? You know. So, man, I'm, it's a journey. To I've got to mold my heart to the Father's heart, to where my kids will see Jesus clear because they see their Daddy on, on Earth. You know, it's tough. Well, that'll get you right there, won't it, church? Good morning on every campus. So glad that you're here. Welcome to church. And then one more time, can we just say thank you to every single dad that is here with us today by putting our hands together. Let's honor the fathers of the house. We're so grateful for you. From one dad to another, I know what it takes. I know that it's tough. I know that there's days that you're just like, I have no more patience. Uh, but it's also one of those great joys that we get to image bear the Lord in our homes. And so uh, I'm just so proud of you men. Um, you know, we always see in the earth, uh, there's this great disparity between Mother's Day and Father's Day at church. And a lot of that happens to be just simply because kids are still in school in uh, Mother's Day. But dads, the ones that you are here today or the ones that you are tuning in with your family, I'm just so proud of you. We're so pastorally proud of you leading your family into the ways of God. And uh, it is an honor to do this alongside of you, brothers. And uh, for any of you young men that are here or single men that are here, you're in a fantastic church to learn how to be a great dad. Uh, one of the things that I get to say in premarital all the time when I'm meeting with, with couples is, hey, if you'll stay around this house, you're going to have a really hard time blowing it because there are some incredible examples of men that have gone through incredibly difficult things and are still honoring God in spite of it. So if you're a young man or you're a young family here, you're in a great house because this is a great place with great examples. So one more time for dads. Awesome job, dads. All right. Well, let me catch us up to speed. If you got your Bible, we're in Ephesians 6. We've already read Ephesians 6 right here. We had a father and son actually do that at the Anderson campus. So well done, Charlie. Did a great job with his dad, Alan. And uh, my job today is to get us into Ephesians 6.15, specifically week three of a spiritual warfare series. Now, just by way of reminder, one of the reasons we're talking about spiritual warfare right now is it's summertime. And one of the things we try to do in the summertime is we know that this is the locker room of New Spring Church. Uh, the college kids have gone home. If you're making the decision to come uh, in the summertime and you're making this a priority, we, we believe you're in. This is the core of cores of our church. And so what we want to do is prepare you, not just with good content for you, but so that you might be a teacher of those around you that you might raise your families with, with this, that you might uh, love on your coworkers or maybe somebody you go to uh, college with next year if you're transitioning to college. We want to help you. And over the 22 and a half years of our church's existence, there's been nothing searched more on our website than the topic and articles that are about spiritual warfare. People have questions about it. It's, it's something that your neighbors are asking about. It's something that as people move to the state of South Carolina and you get a new a neighbor in your apartment complex or in the cul-de-sac where you live or going to school with you, they've got questions about it. And rather than letting them just go to Google, what if you actually had the answers? So we want to equip you. That's one of the things that Ephesians 3 says that the church is supposed to do. 
We've got this broken idea of church in America where there's professionals like me up here with a microphone and then there's people that just come to church, but the Bible has a different way of talking about it. The Bible says that pastors are here to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That what we're doing here is not necessarily the work of the ministry. What we're doing Monday through Saturday is the work of the ministry. And that means that when we get up and leave our buildings today, that the church is leaving the building. And so I'm trying to do my best, and we're trying to do our best as a teaching team to equip you so that you can walk in to conversations that come up, and you might feel a little butterfly in your stomach because you don't necessarily know and you're not prepared, but we want to make sure you're prepared so you can be equipped. So, reminder, spiritual warfare. People have great questions about it, but God has fantastic answers for it. And in Ephesians 6, he talks about, Paul does, how we as the people of God are to be equipped. One of the things we got to remember here is that Satan, Lucifer, is real. His powers are real in the earth. And since the fall of humanity in Genesis 3, the Bible talks about Lucifer as being the God of this world. We covered that in week one. That in this world, Lucifer has, has caused us to fall into temptation. And so without the victory of Jesus, we're going to submit to his temptation. It's impossible. It's impossible. You're going to fall, and we live in a fallen world. It's why bad things happen all over the world. And you can see the bad and know the bad, and you can't overcome the bad unless you are walking in the victory of Jesus Christ. We talked about how Jesus accomplished much more at the cross than just forgiveness of sins. He did accomplish forgiveness of sins, but in so beating sin and death, he also took back the keys of authority, and he is now extending them to you and me, Christian, That's why he says in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me, church, therefore go into the nations and I want you to baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to teach them. So one of the things that we've got to reckon with, Christian, is that you have an unbelievable amount of authority in Jesus. And so you in Christ, Satan can't beat you any longer with power because he's lost to Jesus. So now how does he try to beat us? He beats us with another P. He beats us by gaining permission. So most of the hell that's breaking out in our lives, Christians, is hell that we have allowed or that he has counterfeited or he's duped us into believing. And so we've allowed him to uh, let hell break out into our marriages. We've allowed him to let hell break out into our workplaces. We've allowed him to let hell break out in our families. And so one of the things in Christ that we are called to do Not because there's anything special about us, but because his victory on the cross was efficacious as we're called to walk in victory in our homes, in our jobs, in our schools. And so wherever hell is breaking out, we are called to, in authority of Christ, let heaven break in. Amen? So there's one, listen to me, one theme of the entire scripture. You ready for it? It's the glory of God and the expansion of his kingdom. That is the theme of the Bible from beginning to end is that God is going to get the glory and that his kingdom is going to expand into ultimately we're standing in eternity one day. And so we've got to understand that there's a war. And so last week, my sister Meredith Knox did a fantastic job taking us to the belt, took us to the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. My job today, I want everybody to look down at their feet, is I'm about to talk to you about your shoes. Now, we're on Father's Day, so I figured there'd be a great opportunity for a Father's Day joke here. I don't know if you guys feel this way, dads, moms, But isn't it true that every single time you're getting ready to go, you're trying to go. We were going to a wedding yesterday. We're trying to get there on time, right? And every single time you're trying to get your kids somewhere to go, what is the one thing that you're always waiting on? It's shoes, isn't it? Baby, where's your shoes? I'm ready. No, you're not. You don't got nothing on your feet. Where are your shoes? I don't know, Dad. Are they not where we always take them off? No, they're not there. There's one shoe in mom's car and one shoe in dad's car and one shoe's with the dog over here. And everybody all the time can't find their shoes. Is it not true? Mom and dad, where are your shoes? So today, if you're taking notes, the title of this message is Where Are Your Shoes? Where are your shoes? And I believe our heavenly father wants us to understand where our shoes are. All right, so to start us off, I've got a, a, a thing for coaches. I love coaches. If you came to my office, I've got four coaches that are represented in my office, and one of the coaches that's in my office that I just think the world of is a man by the name of John Wooden. I think we've got a picture of John Wooden. There's Coach Wooden. He's gone on to be with Jesus, but he's famous in the basketball, college basketball world. He coached uh, the UCLA Bruins. In 12 years, this man right here won 10 national championships. 
Um, he's he's lauded as the best coach of all time. It'll probably never be done again. He was also a fantastic believer. So he coached guys like Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He coached those guys back in the day in the 1900s. All right, He won a lot of championships. They've named awards after him. The Wooden Award they've named after him. But one of the things that's fascinating about Coach Wooden is his first practice. It's a thing of legend. All of his old players talk about Coach Wooden's first practice. Everybody show up and all kinds of expectation and all of these five-star accoladed recruits coming in from high school and all the seniors would kind of look at each other and they knew what first practice was. They'd get to the first practice, coach it, blow the whistle, everybody get to half court and he'd say, all right guys, welcome to UCLA. For the first practice, I want us all to head back to the locker room. They'd all go back, trotting back into the locker room. They'd get there, they'd sit down on their benches, and then Coach Wooden would look at them in the eyes and say, fellas, for practice number one, I want to teach you how to put on your shoes. He'd make all these young men take off their socks and shoes. They'd all made it to UCLA. They knew how to play basketball. But his point was, and this is what he would say, all of his old players would repeat this, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And the way you put on your socks and shoes is critically important to the foundation of everything I'm going to teach you at UCLA to play basketball. If you'll listen to me about how to put on your socks and shoes and you'll listen to these coaches, we're going to win some championships because the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Now, I love that story because I think it speaks to where we are today. I almost, almost was going to decide on all of our campuses today to have you take off your shoes the whole time I was preaching this message. But I decided against better judgment that we didn't need that smell of the presence of God to make its way into our auditoriums today. So just visualize with me what it would be like if Coach Wooden sat down and said, I want you to take off your socks and shoes. And what would it look like, I think, if we get to the end of this message, what if we learn to put on our shoes? The shoes, as Paul describes in Ephesians 6, that are to be the shoes of peace. What if we learn to go to war? Listen to me. What if we learn to go to war by putting on peace? Because that's what's on offer today. And I think when we walk out of here today, we're going to have a chance to see the kingdom of God expand. But we're going to have to learn to put on our shoes. Amen? All right. So Ephesians chapter 6. You just read it. Let me focus in on verse 15. Here it is. Ephesians 6.15 says this. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. I'm going to let them leave that up there. I want you guys to look at this for a moment. So... As I was reading this and breaking this down and praying through this, one of the things that stands out is that, that peace is not actually what you're putting on, but rather the gospel of peace makes you ready to go out. I want to, I want to work backwards. This is reverse engineering. So we've got to hear the gospel of peace. We've got to receive it first. That then makes us ready, and now we can go out. All right, I want to make sure you see this. I'm not trying to be overly redundant. I just think it's so important. The gospel of peace is the key to this whole thing. This is not the gospel of war. Although this is spiritual warfare, we've got to realize that there's a gospel of peace. There's a gospel of shalom. And when we understand that and receive that and take that in, it takes us out into a space where we are ready to go to war. All right? So what is that gospel of peace? Well, we're in Ephesians 6, you see right down here. But in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul actually speaks about the gospel of peace really clearly. The whole chapter of Ephesians 2 is the gospel of peace. Here's what he says the gospel of peace is in Ephesians chapter 2. Ready? It says this. Paul wrote, and he said, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, that's every single one of us, from Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by what, church? We've been brought near by the blood of Christ, the cross. For he himself, look what it says, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has now broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So, let me make sure I capture all this for us, this, this gospel of peace is simply this, we were at war with God from birth. You looking at me? We covered this in week one. We were not born children of God. We were born in the image of God, but we've been born in a fallen world with the DNA of the first Adam in us, and so we have sin in our lives. That's why every one of you parents know the truth. Your kids are cute, but they're cute little sinners, amen? 
They pull hair. They do stuff that's unexplainable, don't they? Cute little sinners, right? And so one of the things we've got to help them understand is that's wrong. You can't do that. And us making them aware of that is, is going to help them one day understand that they need something to overcome their sin nature. Namely, they need to be born again in a new nature following Jesus and being filled with his spirit. But what Paul is writing here in Ephesians chapter 2, so important, we can't go any further here, is that we've got to receive the gospel of peace. That we had two divisions in our lives. Everybody hold up the number two, all of our campuses. Hold up a two, you with me? Two divisions. The first division is that we have a division with God. A vertical division. That our sin nature puts us, the Bible says, at enmity, at war with God. Jesus pursued us to bring us into a peace relationship with God because of our sin nature. That's why the cross is so incredible. Jesus died in our place. That's the gospel. But listen to me, and this is the most important part of today. That is not all that Jesus accomplished at the cross. He didn't just bring us into a peace relationship in a vertical way with God. Who else did he bring us into a peace relationship with? One another. Ephesians chapter 2 speaks about the scope of the gospel. The scope of the gospel, specifically in Ephesus and in the time of the, the first writing of the gospel letters, was that the gospel brought people into peace with one another. The gospel allowed for forgiveness to take place between marriages. The gospel allowed you to forgive your children. The gospel allows you to forgive that person who double-crossed you in a business deal. The gospel allows you to love people who aren't like you. The gospel allows you to be a carrier of peace. In, in the time of Christ, it was the peace that needed to be extended between Jew and Gentile. People that had never hung out together. People that didn't grow up together. People that didn't worship like one another. And the entire New Testament, this theme is coming through that no longer is the God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, just the God of the Jewish nation, but instead he is, he is the Savior of everyone, everywhere. This is so important. We've got to catch this. It, it applies to us today. 2,000 years later, the gospel is not just applying to the peace that we have in a vertical relationship. The gospel is the way that we stay married for 50 years. Amen, husbands and wives that have been married for over a decade. There's going to be a whole lot of Jesus Christ peace that you're going to extend your spouse. Amen. All right. There's also going to be a whole lot of Jesus Christ peace that you extend your children. Amen. But there's also going to be a whole lot of Jesus Christ peace that you take into your workplace and you extend to somebody who doesn't vote like you. It's also going to be a whole lot of Jesus Christ peace that you, you carry into your neighborhood that's going to allow you to begin to be friends or to love people who didn't grow up like you. And so this gospel of peace is such a powerful tool. And I just want to pause right here and I just want to say, one of the fallacies that I have falsely believed about this armor is that it... The gospel of peace, it's, it's not that important. Like, let's talk about the sword, man. Father's Day, let's talk about the sword. Dudes want to talk about swords on Father's Day. Or the helmet, man. The helmet's cool. That's kind of like football helmets or army helmets or helmets, man. And we're talking about peace? What are we talking about? Well, here's the deal. I want you to think this. I want you to write this down. I believe that the shoes that are on our feet are actually our secret weapon. Maybe you've never thought about the gospel of peace being a secret weapon, but I want you to know in spiritual warfare, the peace you carry is your superpower. It's a secret weapon. It absolutely demolishes the enemy. The enemy cannot handle when we walk in peace because he is all about division. He is all about conflict. He's all about shouting and screaming and slapping and fighting and shooting and killing and division, division, division. And when you have received the gospel of peace that comes through Jesus, not just to, uh, to again, bring you into right relationship with God vertically, but to extend right relationship with those around you, you demolish the strongholds of the enemy in our communities and it stands out as a light in the darkness in a world that's screaming. We are a people of peace. All right, so you gotta catch this picture if you're gonna have a good fit on your feet when you leave church today and when you get up tomorrow. I wanted to get some pictures of war into your mind because I started to really think about this and pray on this and I've got two pictures that I wanna put in your mind because I believe I have probably thought about being ready for war in the wrong way, and maybe you did too. 
So I've got a picture, actually. I've, I've, I've not fought in a war. I don't know if you have. I know, I know people that have. But the, the, the folks that I have high regard for and respect for, and maybe many of you do too, are the folks that we read about and know, maybe folks that have gone on to be with the Lord from the greatest generation who fought in World War II, specifically. Who fought in a day we just celebrated earlier this month, known as D-Day. And on D-Day, in uh, June 6, 1944, we saw the Allied forces pour out on the beaches of Normandy. And maybe like you, you're thinking about movies like Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. And the emotions of this moment as the largest amphibious attack in modern warfare had ever occurred. And these young men poured out on five beaches of France to go against the evil Nazi regime. And many of them lost their lives that day. But historically, this was the turning point of the war. And I want you to just right now, before we move any further, to think about what it would be like to be in that, that vehicle right there. Moments before you entered battle. Hear the sounds of the bullets hitting your vehicle. The sounds of the, the big 50 cows going off on the beachheads. The sounds of the airplanes flying overhead. I think Steven Spielberg captured the visceral images as I just can recall watching Saving Private Ryan and seeing young men wet themselves, others throw up on themselves, others praying. This was the way they got ready for war. This was what readiness for war looked like. Now, many of them, of course, we know the heroin, heroism of that day, uh, and many of them gave their lives, and we saw, again, things turn. But just a few short months later, in 1945, I have another image that I want to put in your hearts and mind. All right, here's the next image. This is the image that's kind of lived on. It's transcended of Times Square on V-Day, Victory Day. All around the world, Businesses shut down and people walked out on the streets. They called it the ticker tape parade. Makeshift confetti was flying from the skyscrapers of New York City as people were throwing paper in the air for three straight days. One of the comments I read about the, the V-Day was, uh, it was, a lady wrote, said it was like men and women all over the world hadn't laughed for almost four years, hadn't smiled, hadn't celebrated. They, they just bottled everything up with anxiety because of the, war, the world's warfare. And it was like it got, all got uncorked once everybody was signing peace treaties. And so this was the image, not just in America, but in Great Britain and around the world. Because peace was here. People were publishing peace. People were talking about peace. Now you could laugh. Now you could have birthday parties. Now you could, you know, you could think about you know, living life again, going to school again, getting your job again, uh, having a family again. All of these things were available. Now listen, I want you to get those two images in your head, and I want you to think about this. The gospel of peace is that second image, not the first one. And as we get ready every single day of our lives to step into the spiritual warfare of conflict that's out there, you don't need to put on the fear and anxiety of that first image, you need to put on the joy and the surety of the second image. That is what it is like to cover yourself and clothe yourself from victory. We're not going out and fighting for victory. Tomorrow, next fall, the next election, the next big announcement on the news, while it is unknown and none of us can know it, we don't know the, the outcome of tomorrow. We do know the outcome of the war. Amen? And we are the people of victory. We are the ones that hold the keys of laughter and joy and smiles. And your peace and being clothed in it is a massive witness to a world that is just in an unbelievable struggle with turmoil, etc. Now, Paul... As he wrote about peace, this was not the only place he wrote about it. He wrote about it all through the book of Romans. And every time that Paul wrote about peace, he always, listen, listen, he always wrote about it in regards to your shoes. It's one of the common things you'll see Paul write about. And I want to show you where he got it in just a moment. And I want you to see that it's the secret weapon. He talks about it in Romans 16, 20. I want you to see this. Look at the peace and the war that is simultaneously held in tensions in Romans 16, 20. Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, the God of peace. Peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Look at this. The God of peace, the God of shalom, right? That God, the God of peace, will soon violence. Crush Satan under whose feet? Who's it say? Your feet. I want you to see that peace is your secret weapon. Peace is our secret weapon. Peace is not an option. 
It's not like we get up in the morning and we pick up the sword and we put on the belt and we put on the breastplate and we put on the helmet and we leave our shoes like our kids do. Where are your shoes, baby? What are you doing? And I believe God is looking at the church going, church, where are your shoes? It's your secret weapon. It's not just an accessory that goes with your style. It's the secret weapon that's going to advance the kingdom of God in the earth. And I want to look at you, New Spring, and say, your shoes of peace, that are the readiness you get, are your secret weapon. Now, I just mentioned that Paul keeps drawing on this same imagery. I want you to see where he got it from. Because you and I, most of us, we we're not Jewish. And so we don't know the Jewish scriptures the way the people that Paul was writing to in the synagogues did. But Paul was drawing from Isaiah 52, this imagery. Every single time, this is where the imagery of shoes of peace comes from. I want to read it to you because I think there's some things to be gained. Because it's, it's at a certain moment in warfare that Paul draws from. He draws from this war where we're waiting to find out the outcome of the war. In Isaiah 52, uh, verse 7 and following, here's what Isaiah says. He says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That's gospel. How beautiful are the feet who brings the gospel, the good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. Anybody need any more happiness today? Right, this is the key. Yeah. Who, who brings good news of happiness, who, who publishes salvation, who says out loud to Zion, the city, Jerusalem, who says these words, your God reigns. You see, and it's in quotes there. The voice of the watchmen, they now lift up their voice, and together they begin to sing for joy. You see how this good news leads to joy? For eye to eye, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. And now watch what they do. They act. They break forth together in singing. You waste places of Jerusalem. So now there's some tough, maybe, maybe these are the slums of Jerusalem. Maybe the, You waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He's redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm. Come on, dads. Y'all know what it's like to say, son, daughter, come look at your daddy's muscle. Come on. Come right here. That's what God's doing. God's saying, look at my muscles. Look how strong I am. He has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. All right? So here's the imagery. There's watchmen on the walls of the city of Jerusalem. They're at war. They're wondering are we going to win the war? The question is still out. They're looking to the hills, and they see the marathon runner who's been sent from the battle lines. And as the marathon runner is running, they can tell, the watchmen can tell if they're carrying good news or bad. And this marathon runner is carrying good news, and so he makes the statement, how beautiful are the feet of the one who comes running with the good news. And what is the marathoner doing? Is the marathon runner waiting till he gets to the city? No, he's shouting out from the hills. And he's running, he's saying, it's good news. We've won. There's victory. No more war. No more fighting. Peace, peace, peace. And the, the watchmen on the towers, they don't wait for the marathon runner to even get there. They start to let everybody around the tower, all the other watchmen know. It's good news. There's no more war. Peace, salvation, Freedom, our king has won. And it goes around the city walls. And then the people inside the city, they're hearing the news. And it's just this cascade. And now people that were maybe, maybe they were just fatigued. Or maybe they've been cut off from the food supplies, the water supplies, or whatever happens in war. It's tough, tough. They start to celebrate and songs break out in the city streets. People that haven't sung for years start to sing. People come out and they, they start to get excited because the war is over. There's victory. And so three things that I want you to write down that when you understand that you've got peace in your heart that you're going to do. You ready? Three things. These are really quick. Three things. You're going to do three things. You're going to go. You're going to speak. You're going to sing. These are three things that understanding the gospel of peace is going to cause in a heart. It's going to cause you to go places you've not gone, to tell them the good news. It's going to cause you when you go, not just to go, but you're actually going to open your mouth and you're going to say, it's good news, no more division, no more fighting. There's been peace that's won, peace with God and peace with one another. And not only that, there's going to be this communal aspect that we saw in Isaiah 52. It's going to cause us to sing. 
If you want to get a snapshot of what this new kingdom, this new city looks like, look around your campus this morning. As men and women have come from every kind of make of life, from their workplaces and their homes, they've come out from their their houses, they've come out from their subdivisions, they've come out from their jobs, and they've come together this morning from way different backgrounds, young and old, and they've come together and they're lifting up their voices and they're saying to one another, there's good news, there's hope. And what do we just get done doing for the last 30 minutes on all of our campuses? We're singing together about the kingdom that is to come, the city, the new Jerusalem that we'll be in one day. But in the meantime, there's still a war out there that we've got to make sure that we have got our shoes on our feet. So you come together on a Sunday to gather together to get encouragement so that you can scatter Monday to Saturday and tell the good news so that you can come back on Sunday to get your encouragement again so that you can scatter again Monday to Saturday and carry the good news. So your job right now is you're a part of the city singing. But your job here in just a little bit is you're going to turn into that marathon runner running with the good news. And it's your job to carry it to your school. It's your job to carry it to your cul-de-sac. It's your job to carry it to your neighbor. It's your job to carry it to your coworker. And so we are those that come carrying peace. This is our secret weapon. I want to show you how to apply this because it's been something that's, you you maybe have seen this on our walls of our, um, our campuses, but we have five values here as a family. Five values that come straight out of Scripture. And, and the one that's really informed the most about by this context of peace is this idea of pursuing in common unity. And this idea of pursuing in common unity is this is exactly what Jesus Christ did when he was sent by the Father. He came and he came to us with good news. I'm bringing peace, shalom. There's no more war. I'm going to die for you. And so what we say is we now, our job is we're going to invite everyone, everywhere, into peace with God, vertical peace, which will lead to peace with one another. Peace among the nations, peace among the, among the different division places in the earth, peace among the races. This is one of the reasons why we have something to say, Christian, in this moment of cultural upheaval, is we actually have peace. We have peace to offer. Now, I just wanna point this out because it's one of the greatest examples that I have ever seen. How many of, this is, a, this is gonna be a really yes and no question on all of our campuses. You're gonna be absolutely in or absolutely out on this. There is no middle ground. I need to know where my mayonnaise lovers are in the house today. Where are the people that love mayonnaise? Look at all these people. Wow, praise God. I'm not one of you, okay? My whole life, everything's dry. Now, I love mayonnaise for what I'm about to use it as an example. But where are my people that can't stand mayonnaise? Two hands right here. Now, what's really weird is I love ranch, but I don't like mayonnaise. It's the strangest thing. Now, what mayonnaise is known as in the, in the cooking world is it's known as an, an emulsifier, okay? Mayonnaise is made as an emulsion. Do you know what mayonnaise is? It's only really three things. It's made out of oil and water. Now, let me ask you a question. If you put oil and water in a container, what happens to the oil and water, church? It separates. Now, we do things with Italian dressing right before we put it on our salad. What do we do? Shake it up, pour it on dressing. But if you left it there, it separates. Listen, listen, listen. When it comes to everybody in the earth that is trying desperately to go after unity, the culture is trying. They really are. They want to do the right thing. And they're trying every kind of way. But you know what they're doing? All they're doing is they're shaking up the Italian dressing for a nanosecond, and it's going to separate back out because they don't have the key ingredient. Do you know what the key ingredient is if you want to make mayonnaise? The key ingredient, somebody yelled it, to make mayonnaise between oil and water is you got to introduce eggs. Egg whites are the emulsifier. And when you take oil and water and you introduce the key ingredient of egg white, you're going to see oil and water come together. Look at me. The key ingredient to the division in our world is not going to be your company's culture line that comes out. It's not going to be the hiring of a new person at your job. It's not going to be the new politician in the White House. The key ingredient is sitting right here at New Spring Church. It's Jesus Christ's gospel. 
And the gospel of Jesus is what brings us into a place of peace with God, which leads to peace with one another. And without the key ingredient of the gospel of Jesus, we're just going to continue to go through these cycles where the world tries to shake up oil and water and get everybody to get along. But nobody's going to get along until you introduce the gospel because we've got a whole lot of brokenness in our past and a whole lot of brokenness in our present that we cannot overcome without the never-ending fountainhead of the blood of Jesus. The gospel is the key ingredient. And listen, well, don't just amen it this morning in New Spring Church. You've got to walk in the gospel. You've got to walk it out. How did Jesus pursue uncommon unity? Well, he did it with a cross. And I just want to say very clearly, if you and I are going to put on the gospel of peace tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, and carry it into our earth, we're going to have to enter into the same kind of sacrificial living Jesus did. So let me give you three activation points. Three ways to activate the gospel of peace. Number one, I'm going to encourage you to honor every single person you see. Everyone. All right? You mean the person who's got a completely different sexual ethic than me? Absolutely honor them. You mean the person that absolutely posts everything about that other party on their timeline? Yes, honor them. You mean the person that I had to fight with last year? Yeah, ask them ask to forgive you and then honor them. Honor everyone. Why? Because this is the reason that everyone is valuable because we've all been made in the image of God. And when you honor everyone, you are honoring your God who made them. This whole idea of honoring everyone, it's the reason why Christians honor the preborn. Because they're made in the image of God. Y'all know that, right? It's not just a voting thing. It's because a preborn child is made in the image of God. That's why we work to honor them. We honor everyone. Number two, I want to challenge you to pursue relationships with people that aren't like you. Not because the White House tells you to do it. Not because some person out there tells you to do it. Because your Lord tells you to do it. Your Lord tells you that the gospel is the thing that's going to bring Jew and Gentile together. It's the thing that's going to invite the Samaritan in. It's the thing that's going to invite everyone everywhere in. You're going to do this not because somebody out there is telling you, but because you have the spirit of the living God in you, and you're going to pursue people that aren't like you. Now, you can apply that definition however you want. Old people, I don't know if you're old or not. That's for you to decide. I need you, in Jesus' name, to pursue some young people at New Spring Church. Pursue some college students. Show them what it's like to, to be married and to make it through life and to raise a family. Invite them when the, when the college kids come back next fall. Invite some of them over to your house for a meal. Hey, come eat with us. I'll buy you a steak. Man, they've been living on ramen noodles for too long. They would come to your house for a church after church Sunday meal, okay? Bless them. Hey, invite somebody to your house that does not have the same melanin you do. Can I say that in South Carolina this morning? Invite somebody to your house to break bread with you. Go out to dinner with somebody that doesn't look like you. Hey, get to know them. Why? Because the world's telling you to? Absolutely not. Because the gospel is telling you to. Because you're going to put on peace. Number three, I'm going to invite you to walk in forgiveness. Because listen, this is our, this is our opportunity as Christ followers. Nobody else can give forgiveness. They can fake forgiveness, but Christians actually have something to offer. We have an infinite supply of forgiveness that we're able to give to the world, and the world needs lots of it, amen, because we know the source of forgiveness. So this means you're going to be quick to ask for forgiveness when you make a mistake, and when somebody, dear Jesus, asks you to forgive them, extend them forgiveness. Forgiveness is an unbelievable balm. It's like better than Neosporin, y'all. It heals everything, all right? It heals it all. But we've got to be a people that ask for forgiveness quickly and, and a people that extend forgiveness quickly. It's one of the most powerful things. And while I'm talking to dads on Father's Day, I bring this up every time I talk about my dad. But one of the things I remember about my dad, he was so strong. He was so big. I remember getting in fights in the, the preschool saying, my dad could beat up your dad, right? I don't know if you guys did that. My dad's stronger than your dad. But here's one of the things about the strength of my father. He was the first person in my memory banks, deeply encoded, that I can remember asking me as a young man to forgive him. He, he yelled at my mom or yelled at me or said something. I don't even remember what the situation was. But I remember getting in the car driving with him somewhere and him stopping at a stop sign, turning around and locking eyes with me in the back seat and said, son, will you forgive me? And man, oh man, that, that is something I've never forgotten through the years. And it's something that we have the power to 
bring into the earth as we pursue uncommon unity. Now, I want to pray for us, and we're going to go into a time of worship. But listen, as you leave today, I want to challenge you not to just let the gospel get to your head. Don't just let the gospel make the 18th inch journey to your heart. Those two are important. But here's what I need you to do today. I need you to leave today with the gospel in your shoes. And the gospel in your shoes means you're going to carry peace. It's your superpower. It's your secret weapon. Let's honor everyone. Let's pursue relationships with people that aren't like us. And let's ultimately extend forgiveness. This is what the world is going to look at and go, y'all different. New Spring Church, how do y'all get along in the middle of this whole world? How y'all getting along when culture's breaking out? How y'all getting along when you're going through election cycles? You want me to tell you how you're going to get along? You're going to do it because you've got the secret weapon, the gospel of peace. Amen? Would you stand to your feet and let's pray and worship teams are going to come. Father God, I pray for the shoes on the feet of every single man and woman that's heard this message today. Would you help us wrestle with it? Would you help us be encouraged by it? Would you help us carry the gospel of peace into a world that is divisive and fractured and shouting and screaming? And Lord, would you help us walk out with this powerful weapon of victory and invite people in that they might have peace with God and peace with each other. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord a hand? Let's sing and declare what the gospel of peace can do, what we're prepared to take into the world. There's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't Save all things are possible. Come on, sing that again. Sing, there's no prison for you to break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise. No soul that you can't save.
Thank you guys, and Brad, thank you for that message. And listen, I'm gonna give you an incredibly, 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 incredibly practical way to walk that out. So God has given us the feet of peace and unity, and tonight we are gonna have a night of worship celebrating those exact things at six o'clock, and I wanna invite you to come back and celebrate Juneteenth with us tonight at six o'clock. It's gonna be an amazing time of worship, it's going to be amazing time, an amazing time of food and fellowship out here on the field to my left, your right, and you ought to be a part of it. It's something that you can step into. And let me just lean in a little bit. If there's a part of you out there going, yeah, that's not really for me, you're the person that ought to come. So just let that sit for a second. If you're like, eh, I don't really like that kind of stuff, you should come and you should be a part of it. And the reason you should do that is because like four or five years ago, I was that person. I was like, that's not for me. Like, I'm not opposed to it, but I'm like, that's just not my thing. Like, I'm not, I, I don't know. Like, it's going to be kind of, they're going to dance and look at me. I mean, I'm not going to do that. So what is that about? But you ought to come, be a part of, try something different. Like celebrate people that don't look like you. Step in because it's fun and you'll make new friends and we'll eat barbecue together and it's going to be a good time. So I'm inviting you, come. Bring your friends, hang out with us. Come back next week for fireworks. That's gonna be awesome. God gave you shoes of peace, not Hermes, the Greek God of mischief, shoes with wings. He gave you shoes to carry something that matters. So do that, carry it to the people that you love. I'm super grateful for you. I hope to see you back tonight. I hope to see you back next week. I wanna bless you and then we're gonna go about our day. Father, you bring the spirit of peace. And so it's with that that I bless your people to walk out of here with their shoulders down and their feet firmly on the ground, knowing that you're in control so we don't have to be. Be blessed. Have an amazing afternoon. We'll see you in eight hours. Love you guys.